Um, we are delighted to have as our guest speaker tonight, Jeffrey Cunningham, Lynette S. Autry Professor of Humanities and author of a memoir of Mexico and the days of the dead. Jeff was born in Jackson, Tennessee, earned a bachelor's degree in English literature from Rice University and a master's degree in photography uh, from the Institute of Design at the Illinois Institute of Technology, where he studied with well-known photographers Aaron Siskin and Arthur Siegel. Jeff returned to Houston in 1968 to begin a career in photography, documentary filmmaking, and journalism. He joined the art department at Rice University in 1969, and he continues to teach there today as a Lynette S. Audrey Professor of Humanities and Professor of Visual and Dramatic Arts. During a career that spans over 50 years, uh, he's received um, many awards, but and um, accolades, which are many of which are set out in the program. Um, his list of accomplishments is long. Books have won awards, his photographs are in major museums and collections across the U.S., and his work has been published in many anthologies. He is here tonight to discuss his latest book, A Trail of Marbles, A Memoir of Mexico in the Days of the Dead, which was just released this month. He continues to direct the Pozos Art Project in teaching photography and art to children in Mineral de Pozos, Mexico, and in Houston. Thank you, Jeff, for being here tonight and sharing your experiences with Rice. Please join us in welcoming Jeff Cunningham. I first saw do this, but you know, here's a copy of my book. 
Uh, and if you open it up and you give it a bit of flip, uh, and you know, a little experience will tell you, good paper, good paper. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I just want to uh, love books not just as a vessel for the delivery and dissemination and the archiving of great photographs and, and great work in relation to photographs. I love them as objects. Uh, in this particular book, in over the years, I've done photo books in a great variety of ways. I've worked with commercial publishers, I've worked with academic publishers, I've done self-publishing, private publishing, and nowadays, as most of you probably know, you can do a book in an edition of one copy. A very beautiful book by what's called on-demand printing. It's like blur books and print a very beautiful book for you, one copy or two. And I do that often. I mean, if I go on a trip and have a lot of good photographs from that trip and want to remember it, want to put it together as a book, I do. This particular book that I'm going to talk about tonight and share with you has evolved really since 1984. And it has been a long labor of love. Uh, it is, first of all, a memoir. It is a carefully structured sequence of words and pictures through which I attempt to find meaning and understanding of my travels in Mexico throughout the last 40 years. It's a visual and verbal record of those travels. Interwoven with that memo memoir is a trove of information that I've gathered from a lot of sources as I have studied ancient Amerindian cultures and I bring these sources, fragments of them, together in the book so that hopefully the book is not only a memoir of my travel, but also uh, a kind of a learned guide for those who want to understand the history and the continuing kind of evolution of this amazing celebration. And finally, the book is, in fact, a sort of love poem to Mexican people, those who welcome me and help me as I travel. I feel it's important to begin with a kind of a disclaimer. Even though I've spent about a third of my life in the last 40 years in Mexico, and even though my permanent home is there, even though the vast majority of my reading and study over that period of time has been about Mexican history and culture, I am not Mexican. I will never be a Mexican much as I might want to be. Okay? I am and always will be an outsider looking in. I make no pretense of having a full understanding of this complex and ancient culture. As I was putting together uh, this presentation and thinking about this disclaimer, I was reminded of something that I hadn't thought of in a good while. The first book that deeply influenced me and inspired me as a photographer. The landmark book by the French photographer on the Turkey Resolve. The book is The Decisive Moment. One of the truly great books in the history of photography. And it's a sequence of his photographs made around the world. India, China, uh, the United States, all through Europe. And it begins with what I always thought was the oddest statement and now I think I understand it. Here's the statement. At the beginning of the decisive moment, before the flow of pictures, he writes, these photographs taken at random by a wandering camera do not in any way attempt to give a general picture of any of the countries in which that camera has been at large. I'll leave it at that. Um, it's the other. You know, I'm not Mexican, and I do not claim to understand Mexico in the way a Mexican would, but I have my own experience, and so with that, I will begin. One evening, many years ago, after I began traveling in Mexico, I bought a collection of my color photographs to a class I was teaching at life. One by one, I leafed through the photographs, showing them to my students, and telling them stories of my adventures in Mexico. One picture showed a trail of yellow flower petals on the ground leading to the doorway of the stone house. And a student in the class, Monica Weinhauer, I remember her so well, had 
visual arts and Spanish major, asked me to tell her why the flower petals were there. I explained that I had taken the photograph on the day of the death. When the spirits of those who have died are granted divine permission to return to earth for one day each year. The petals have been placed on the ground to guide the spirits home where their family was waiting to welcome them. After a moment of thought, a student reminded me that the Spanish word for marigold, maravilla, was also the Spanish word for marble or miracle. The Sendero de Maravilla, she explained, is what you're sharing with us right now, both literally and figuratively. You're showing us a photograph of a trail of marigolds and you're telling us stories of the trail of marbles that you have been following for all these years. So, a trail of marbles, Sendero de Maravilla, she said, pick your language, but when you do a book, that should be your title. That was in 1992. This year, 30 years, later, 30 years later, I finished the book, and last week it was released. It begins uh, with this uh, quote from Moose and Other Books, 1935. What gives value to travel is fear. It is the fact that at a certain moment, when we are so far from our own country, we are seized by a vague fear and an instinctive desire to go back to the protection of old habits. At that moment, we are feverish, but also porous, so that the slightest touch makes us quiver to the depth of our being. We come across a cascade of light, and there is eternity. This is why we should say, not say that we travel for pleasure. I look upon it more as an occasion for spiritual testing. Pleasure takes us away from ourselves in the same way as distraction takes us away from God. Travel, which is like a greater and greater science, brings us back to ourselves. The book is dedicated to my father. Dedicated to my father, whose spirit I share, and who introduced me to Mexico on a short trip um, right after I graduated from Mars. So I'll come back to that in, in a moment. But for now, I want to talk about the first trip I made of exploration, the first trip of kind of personal exploration that I made to Mexico. Um, the year was 1982, and I had a sabbatical from teaching, and um, I took off for uh, a long uh, travel of exploration um, in Mexico. Um, this is my route on that first long trip. Um, down through northern Mexico, through uh, uh, Monterrey, Saltillo, down to Real de Catorce, San Miguel. That was my first trip. And the trip lasted roughly five months. <laughs> <laughs> it was the last week of January when I drove away from Houston before dawn and headed south. 320 miles later, U.S. Highway 59 ended in a maze of chain link fences and toll booths. I could see the shallow waters of the Rio Grande ahead. At the first stoplight, a dozen men swarmed my truck from all directions. One pushed a huge carved wooden figure of the Virgin of Guadalupe toward my window. Others offered wiper blades, road maps, mangoes, chiclets, hubcaps, and gear shift knobs for sale. As I waited for the light to turn green, one man slapped at my window and jumped on the hood of my truck. Splashing soapy water across my windshield, he went to work with a tiny squeegee. In one fluid sweeping motion up and down and across and back like a magician waving a wand. He cleared the silky water in a flash, leaving me a crystal clear, spotless view of the road ahead. I've driven tens, if not hundreds of thousands of miles in Mexico, and it continues to be a great adventure. This is Highway 57, the primary trunk road from Mexico City to the border. Uh, leading through the state of San Luis Potosí. On that first trip, I had uh, largely given up the small 35 millimeter camera that I had used for a decade before, and I had gone to the opposite. I had a eight by 10 view camera. It's a big instrument. And with the tripod, it weighs to 60, 70 pounds. And that was the camera that I was interested in using, partly because it was a trip of discovery, and in discovery, I wanted to kind of slow down and work very carefully. 
Everything was new to me. I photographed this simple adobe house with the child in the doorway, the roof line of the house echoing the line of the mountains behind it. I arrived in San Miguel Allende after about four days and photographed the colonial architecture there. Photographed the Sistine Chapel of the Americas at Totemilco. And I began doing a series of portraits. I've really never done portrait photography before, but the big camera seemed to lend itself to that. Uh, carrying that big camera around the streets of San Miguel kind of attracted attention. It wasn't like you're going to sneak up on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a deliberate act, and the big camera seemed to lend a kind of authenticity to the process. In the book, I reflect for a moment um, on the whole idea of portraiture and photography, and particularly portraiture of people in another place, and particularly portraiture with a big camera. Uh, I write, the unique ability of the camera to record both the physical details and the ethereal qualities of a person borders for me on the magical. When I release the shutter of my camera, an emulsified surface inside the camera, the film, receives a scattering of light, and later the surface is bathed in chemicals, resulting in a visual rendering of the subject. Every last detail of the subject's physiognomy is recorded. The camera is capable of recording with precision every strand of the subject's hair, every subtle curve and shape of their facial features, and perhaps most astonishingly, the very essence of their being. Even if this can be explained, it's pretty close to magic. And if not magic, then it can seem almost beyond comprehension. I traveled continuing south and went the first time to Mexico City, where the urban street life fascinated me. Went back to my 35 millimeter camera bit as I photographed people, you know, breathing fire in the streets and showing photographs of um, Ringo men, women in their falls and saw for the first time uh, the murals of Diego Rivera depicting the conquest of Mexico. This is the beginning of my interest in Mexican history to which I am totally fascinated and attached. Um, my second trip to Mexico, after the one with my father after graduation, was a much shorter trip and uh, not nearly so much a voyage of discovery as an attempt to visit a friend who was living in San Miguel Allende. But together, Bert, my friend from high school, and I decided that we wanted to go into Mexico City and try to find the great photographer, Manuel Alvarez Bravo, who was still alive at that time. We had no idea how we would find him, but we did find him in the phone book in Mexico City. <laughs> when had a visit, he uh, brought out a vast archive of prints which we've been through. Everyone who knows the history of photography knows of Alvarez Bravo, but very few pictures of his at that time had been reproduced. And so in seeing hundreds of his photographs, it was really a rare and wonderful opportunity. Um, among the pictures that I saw there was this one. I write in the book, uh, uh, Bravo's photograph, Dia de los Muertos, has grown to have a very special meaning for me. I can't say how many times I've contemplated this photograph since 1971, but I consider it among the best of Alvarez Bravo's pictures. For me, it's a brilliant, totally enigmatic image. The subject is a young, dark-skinned girl sitting in the sunlight. She beautifully rendered in the rich, subtle tones of the silver yellow print. You can virtually feel the sunlight on her skin. She holds what appears to be a human skull, as though offering the skull to the photographer and thus to the viewer. A single Spanish word has been written across the forehead of the skull. Amor, love. A Christian cross hangs on a chain around the girl's neck. What are we meant to make of this richly descriptive photograph? What does it mean, this image that brings together visual elements that suggest youth, beauty, pleasure, faith, and death? Like all good photographs, Humbert's Bravo's Dia de los Muertos 
shows the viewer much, but explains nothing. What I could not have known at the time was that this photograph had planted itself inside my mind and would grow like a good seed, eventually bringing with it an understanding of this complex ancient culture and of life itself. I had traveled in Mexico through 1983 and 1984 and had been um, invited several times to travel by Mexican people to be sure and come back on a particular date, November 1st and 2nd, the Days of the Dead, for the most important celebration in Mexico. Uh, in 1984, I decided to make that first trip, and I decided that for my first trip, I would go to the most famous celebration uh, of uh, Dia de los Muertos in Mexico, and that's around Lake Pascual in the state of Michoacan. There's the lake, there's the landscape of, of Michoacan. And when I arrived on that first trip uh, at night, I took a hotel room and woke up the next morning and looked out my window, and this is the scene that I saw. Uh, the main plaza in Pascual covered with vendors and displays of all kinds. Um, there were ceramic figures often for sale by people who had come from villages up in the mountain, often with their children in tow, sleeping in the background. There were people weaving fabrics on the spot. You could have a tablecloth or a bedspread woven right there for you. There were women selling beautiful embroidery. There were people selling carved wooden masks. These uh, particular um, ceramics. I write about it in the book, I won't go into it now, but they're from the village of Ocomicho, and they're particularly interesting because they're very raunchy. And I did a little research in that why one village in Mexico turns out these pictures of you know devils and angels getting it on and, and you know, the Noah's Ark with the pro full of demons. At any rate, um, the square around uh, Pascuaro was full of all these marvelous crafts. The most famous of which are the sugar skulls. And you've probably all seen at one time or another the sugar skulls with the profusion of them there, the beauty of them. And uh, late in the afternoon, this is probably October 30th, a couple of days before the actual days of the dead, children come by and they buy skulls and eat them. Or maybe they find one with the name of a friend on them and they give them as a gift. But the, uh, the, uh, central thing about Day of Dead celebration in Pasquaro that I saw that first time was the profusion of flowers. I had never seen flowers in such a together before. Um, and in particular, this flower. This is the Mexican marigold, or the Simpasucho, okay? Uh, as it's known in the novel language. In the years ahead, I would learn that nothing is so intimately associated with Day of the Dead as this radiantly beautiful, fragrant flower. It's impossible to truly describe either the film or the digital camera, the radiant color of this flower. Uh, you can come close, but there's something about the richness, the subtleness of this color that escapes any sort of description. And there on the square in Pascual, in a window, I saw my first <laughs> There on the left, you see the ofrenda, which is uh, a collection of flowers and fruits and favorite things and a portrait of the deceased member of the family, which is his honor. All this is happening in an amazingly kind of festive uh, environment with bands playing. Um, that afternoon, I noticed people were leaving. This would be like the 31st and then the 4th. Day the people were leaving the main square and kind of heading out into the country. So I follow. Uh, this is a photograph made along the shores of Lake Pottsboro, heading toward the village of Iwazio. This is the cemetery in Iwazio, and you can see the, um, uh, the ruins of the Tarascan um, temples in the background, which were built in the 16th and early 17th century. Um, I found children playing in the cemetery, um, climbing trees and wrestling around in the grave. There was uh, overall a kind of uh, an air of comfort, an air of celebration uh, in the cemetery that I'd never experienced before. 
Some were kind of repainting um, the names and uh, dates on the gravestones. Others were just decorating with flowers. Um, and toward the end of the afternoon, they began to leave. And they left behind these beautiful, um, ephemeral, uh, floral decorations on the graves. This is the first time I had seen this. And later, in, in my talk on that, I'll show you a, a really extraordinary example of that. But it's one of those many uh, kind of folk arts, if you will, relating to Day of the Dead uh, that I had had a hint of before, but had never quite seen until now. Uh, the night of November 1st, I took a launch of a boat with a bunch of other people out to Canizio, which is uh, famous for its uh, historic celebration of the Day of the Dead. And there I found uh, the indigenous people with their own very simple offerings, kind of waiting for the arrival of the spirits. Uh, midnight, 2 a.m., I'm kind of back on the mainland and in the cemetery at Iwatio, which is just this amazing scene. And the, the cemetery is lit, lit with thousands of candles. It's a glow in them. And families are there. Families are there. Um, sleeping, uh, eating, uh, playing the guitar, kind of waiting through the night for the spirits to arrive. The traditional belief of when the spirits arrive exactly and how they're handled varies, I learned, a great deal from one place to other in Mexico. In the Lake Pascual area, the idea that the spirits arrive at dawn on November the 1st. So these people spend the night of October 31st in the cemetery, and then at dawn, they take the spirits home with them. The first day, November 1st, is the day of the incentives of the children. So the uh, spirits of the children who have died uh, come home, and also of women who have died in childbirth. And then on November the 2nd, the other the adult uh, spirits arrive. Uh, it's a very beautiful thing to witness. It's very difficult to photograph. Uh, the contrast between the light of the candles and the, and the shadowy um, um, environments in which the people are sleeping is kind of tough, and over the years I experimented with that, that pretty well. Yeah. Um, I photographed in uh, Oscar for two years, 1984-1985, and um, I also began to photograph other festivals in Mexico. Um, and then a Mexican photographer friend gave me a copy of this book. This calendar of popular fiestas published by the Mexican government was, to say the least, a revelation. It lists 17,000 <laughs> historically documented fiestas annually celebrated across all of Mexico. Not only that, but within it, you, it has maps to the little town. The best, most authentic festivals are out in the middle of nowhere where, you know, basically, progress had not arrived, if you want to call it that. Uh, many of those villages are not on any map, so you need the map within the guide in order to find the village that they're listing. And then, it lists by day of the year where you will find an historic fiesta celebration. I'm not sure if you can see it on the screen here, but here in this two pages at the top, that's November 1st and 2nd, Days of the Dead. And there are actually something like 126 authentic celebrations a day of the So I realized at that point, you know, I'll probably never be anywhere but Mexico for day of the day of the day. <laughs> the second spice that I'm going to take you on, I went many sites all across Mexico during the years, but in my book, I basically take you, if you will, to three sites. The first was to be sure common, and the second was into the state of Puebla. Puebla State is just south and east of Mexico City, and you can see my route here trace. I go south of Mexico City. I actually traveled through the table of Paso de Cortez up in the mountains, where you travel over the sill at the base of um, uh, Popocatepetl, the, the volcano, and you travel up, 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 and then down onto the plain of Puebla. It's a very dramatic um, trip that push you into Pueblo State, and then I travel up into the mountains from the there. It's such a beautiful time to be in Mexico. Flowers everywhere. 
the fields are full of not only the simplicial, but um, uh, all sorts of flowers are being grown and picked and brought into the nearest town or city. This is a, a view of the landscape along the, the highway heading up into the mountains of Pueblo. Uh, and there I found along the road, this is probably two days before the day of the day, probably October the 30th, you know, people bringing uh, the marigolds, the Simpasucho, to their home, celebrating by decorating crosses in their yards, very simple rustic homes. This is the town of, um, the old Spanish town of Quetzalan, uh in the mountains of Puebla, which was my primary destination. The big difference between being here and being in Pascual was that it was not so much a tourist celebration. As marvelous as Pascual is, there were lots of Mexican tourists and lots of foreign tourists. Quetzalan was quite different. There were very few people really in the cemeteries. Um, there were the same sort of decorations on the grave. But there were turkeys in the, in the cemeteries, and dogs sleeping in the cemeteries. And I, as a, uh, as a traveler, um, was uh, you know, kind of an anomaly. Everybody wanted to know where did I come from. Nobody noticed me. I thought there were so many parties. But here, uh, people were curious. People wanted to pose uh, for photographs. With uh, This is uh, the grave of a mother the wife of the man from the left in the picture who had died that year. Um, oh, okay, on time. Uh, this photograph was made in the market um, in Quetzalan uh, the day before the Day of the Dead. And I write a little bit about photography here, so I'm going to give you a little brief uh, fragment about that. Um, I found the market jammed with people, vendors, lining the street. The challenge for me is to find to see and record of the camera a certain order and visual rhythm within the rapidly changing disorder of human activity. Great French photographer Cartier Bresson described this as the decisive moment. The idea that an event unfolds in front of you and the effort is to make in a fraction of a second a perfect rendering of it in which all the elements come together in a beautiful balance and harmony. It's largely misunderstood because most people feel that the decisive moment is about a dramatic interaction between people. The decisive moment is about the perfection of the picture. Shapes and forms uh, come together in a balanced and harmonious way. So the Mexican market with its activity and its um, vibrance is just for me heaven on earth as a photographer. Everything is happening and so, so much complexity. The idea is to try to find a certain order. You know, I became entranced with the woman with the gray hair and the yellow blouse on who's reaching over buying something. And the boy in the maroon sweater, the same color as the coxcomb flowers, and the, the child in the background. It's, it's full of detail and interest. It's so photographic for me. Uh, this fellow, uh, Spanish gentleman, said I should go out to see Macapa, the village nearby, to see the, the, what a great suggestion. This is a village of about 100 people where I saw probably one of the most beautiful, authentic celebrations of the other day. These are ofrendas within the home, very simple, very beautiful. And this is where I made this sequence of pictures um, that um, Monica Weinhammer tagged as Sendero de Maravillas. This is a simple offender inside one home with a kind of ghost-like image of the family passing by on the outside. The trail of flowers going across the floor leading to the offender where all of the favorite things of someone who's died, their favorite foods, their favorite drinks, their musical instruments, their costume, uh, their fiesta costumes are there to be seen. I quote Richard Rodriguez at this point in the book, um, the great Chicano writer who wrote, by rejoining the human for one day in November, the dead remind us that the two worlds, heaven and earth, are in inevitably adjoining. Um, I won't go into detail about this because I'm running a little bit behind where I want to be at this point, but in the book I also talk about the flying pole dance, the voladores, uh, one of the most dramatic and beautiful dances in all of the festival dances of Mexico, where men climb a pole 100 feet into the air 
and spin themselves out into a circle. The effort is for four guys to rotate 13 times, flip over, and hit the ground running. Um, on a surface, it was described by Mexican and Indian peoples as a visual uh, representation of the Nahua calendar, which had 52 months, 13 uh, times 4, 52 months. Okay. But in fact, it was much more than that. It was a demonstration of basically gods coming to Earth to celebrate the festival with humans. Um, I'm going to take a moment here. Because this is kind of my favorite part of the book. Um, I, I had left uh, Sinacapan and was going back toward Puebla City, and I took a run down to Pacachula, which has a great celebration. And uh, there I had just an extraordinary experience. Uh, I was wandering through the central part of Pacachula, when on the east side of the plaza, I spotted an impressive old structure behind a massive stone wall. I could see an elegant facade and two bell towers. A plaque on the wall identified the place as the former monastery, the Convento de San Martín Caballero, built in 1531. Uh, I walked in, uh, looked at the altar in front, found a door to the left leading out, and out of curiosity, followed, walked out the door. My first impression as I stepped out was that the heavens must have opened and gently dropped the petals of every imaginable flower upon the graves that were laid out there. Here and there I could see that some of the petals had once been placed in the shape of crosses. A soft breeze was at work and flower petals were moving ever so slightly. I was witnessing the progression of an ephemeral work of art. By chance or by grace, I had discovered a scene of unimaginable beauty, its beauty shifting ever so slightly as I, the sole witness, watched. The afternoon light was fading fast as I tried to make a photograph of each of the graves. A month later, I studied the proof sheets of the four rows of film that I shot in the 30 minutes or so before the light faded. By then, I had spent considerable time studying the history of Mexico, and I was reminded of Flor de Canto, the flower, the song, the fundamental metaphor that permeates virtually all pre-Hispanic Mexican poetry. As I was photographing these flowers on the graves, I was hearing mariachi bands from the plaza outside playing. The flower of the song, Flor de Canto, is a semantic couplet in which the two words are brought together to express one complex ideal, an ideal so important to the Amerindian cultures that it was judged the only truth on earth. Flore Canto couples flowers with songs, thus bringing together as one the ephemeral nature of all things on earth with the eternal quality of the human heart. Flowers as they bloom and play, fade are the perfect representation of the ephemeral quality of material things, of our bodies, our lives, of all earthly things. Songs, on the other hand, the other half of the couplet, represent what is enduring beyond our lifetimes. Songs represent the essence that leaves the human heart at death, according to Amerindian belief, and ascends to the house of sun, where it is materialized. None of the ancient Mexican poets expressed the metaphor of flora and canto more beautifully than Nezahualcoatl, prince and poet of Escoco. He wrote, with flowers you write, O giver of light. With songs you give color, with songs you shade those who must live on the earth. For we live only in your book of paintings here on the earth. Only with our flowers do we rejoice. Only with our songs as our sadness perish. The third place I'm going to take you, uh, the last place, is to Oaxaca. Oaxaca is more or less due south of Mexico City. Oaxaca City is in a valley between the eastern and western mountain ranges of Mexico. Um, and I had heard in advance that celebrations of Day of the Dead in Oaxaca were quite different, that they were very festive, even raucous. So I wasn't surprised when I began driving to Mexico City to see this ragtag band of people uh, making their way across a cornfield. I followed them. I followed them to the home of a senior Ramirez, who 
introduced me to his cooking team, who was starting mole uh, to be cooked uh, in the days of Ed, ahead, and then took me out to the patio where the men were dancing. These were all men dancing. Uh, at least at that time, I think it's true. Women don't dance, women cook. Women cook and men dance and get foolish. And um, it's a very festive, very wonderful thing to see. That night, the festivities ramped up. This is one of my favorite dancing costumes. This is the guy of a million belts. Uh, he was on his way to the big party, and I chased him six blocks to get this picture. He worth it, don't you think? Uh, you know, uh, the party that night was just amazing. The costume for that was nothing like anything I'd seen, either in Michoacan or in Pueblo or anywhere else. And that night, the fireworks began. Fireworks in Mexico are just kind of crazy. Uh, people launch rockets out of their bare hands. You know, the rockets go up in the air, the, uh, the sparks come down, children run through the spark, their hair catches on fire, someone dances it out, and they keep running. Um, they lit up the sky above, and the sparks fell, and the children ran, and it was just marvelous uh, chaos. The next day, uh, on the first day of the dead, I went into the market in Oaxaca City, the Central Abastos. Wow, if markets in Mexico were wonderful, this one is just kind of beyond itself. There's everything, everything to eat, everything to light and burn, everything to smoke, everything to drink. Um, and on a beautiful day, when it is a photographer's kind of paradise. Here are, you know, uh, toys for day of the dead. Um, I quote a woman named Seville Bedford, who wrote this account of walking through a Mexican market. One floats along the streets in uncertain bliss, swept into rapids of doing, hooting, selling. Everything is agitated, crowded, spilling over. The pavements are narrow, covered in fruit, as one picks one's way over mangoes and avocado pears. One is tumbled into the gutter by a water carrier, avoids a basin of live charcoal, skips up again, scaring a tethered chicken, which shies from an exposed deformity. Now a parrot shrieks at one from an upper window. Lottery tickets flutter one's face. It's just a mass of fabulous chaos. This is a portrait of um, Felix and Petra Gonzalez. I met them in about, probably about 1992. Um, Felix had been a temporary worker in the farms, the fields of the United States in the 50s. So he had about six sentences of English. Uh, the one I heard first was, as I was walking down the street past his house, I heard him say, where are you going, boy? <laughs> <laughs> and I turned around and I said, I don't know. Who are you? And he said, come on in, okay? Felix and Petra became my Mexican family. Every year, usually two or three times a year, I would go to Oaxaca to visit them. Uh, we would sit and eat together. We would talk. At times, Felix and I would sit and talk and the scout for hours. <laughs> Just to be sure that neither of us was taking himself too seriously, we took a nickname, one nickname for both of us. Specifically, we took the nickname Senor Chicharron. <laughs> English translation, Sir Pork Skin, Sir Pork Fat, whatever you know. For whatever reason, it seemed just right that we should both have the same nickname, but when you're drinking with scallops, some things which would ordinarily not seem strange. <laughs> we spoke in our own unique fusion of English and Spanish, each of us becomes more fluent in our private languages we drink. Felix had a lot of curiosity about how I made a living and about my economic means. I recall an afternoon when he asked me how big my cornfield was. <laughs> I told him I had no cornfield. Then he asked me how many cows and chickens I had. I replied that I had no cows and chickens. And he was genuinely puzzled. 
So how did you afford that big truck out there if you don't have a cornfield or anything else? <laughs> well, Felix admired my Chevy truck and he loved to jump in the front passenger seat, twist his hair head around backwards, roll down the window, and let me drive him through town, where he would speak to all the women as we passed. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Say, I am Senor Chicharron, and my driver is Senor Chicharron. <laughs> My friendship with the Gonzalez family was always was already well established. When one year, uh, his son Paco uh, came to me and said, um, "Dad's birthday is tomorrow, and he really wants you to come." I said, oh, "I love, thank you so much. What can I bring?" He said, "Don't bring him anything." I said, "No, no, no, no. It's his birthday. I, this is my birthday. I have to bring him something." No, 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 no. Don't bring him anything. That went on for several generations. <laughs> finally, he said, "Okay." If you want to bring him something, bring him a quarter pounder with cheese and a There's been a recent opening of the You know, there were 16 people living in that compound. There was Felix and Petra and their son Paco and then three sons, each with their wife. There were 16 people there. I knew them. So I'm not a cheapskate. I went by at McDonald's and I got 16 cheeseburgers, 16 orders of french fries, and 16 cokes, and I brought them to them. And I took them into the house. When Paco saw them, he yelled out something, and everybody came in. <laughs> the children first. The children grabbed the cheeseburgers, but the adults swatted them away and put them in the corner and threw ketchup to them. <laughs> Petra grabbed one cheeseburger in each yellow box and stuck it down the hill. She grabbed another one in the kitchen to eat it, okay? Um, Felix showed extraordinarily good manners. <laughs> he took his cheeseburger in his yellow flip top box and put it squarely in front of him. And then he would ceremoniously open the top of the box, take the sandwich out and take one bite, put it back in, close it in, <laughs> and push it away. <laughs> it was um, the most extraordinary meal since Babette's feast. <laughs> it made me uh, welcome, I think, forever in the last. Um, maybe the most memorable day I spent with the Gonzalez family was the time, the day before the Day of the Dead, I believe the year was 1997, and we drove into the mountains uh, above Teotihuacan, their town, Petra Peak Flowers, and she brought them back and she um, went to the great, to the cemetery there in town and she decorated, cleaned and decorated her mother's grave. You see the apples, the peanuts, the oranges that she's laid on the grave along the flowers. The idea, of course, is that the fragrance and the flavor of the fruits and the fragrance of the flowers will draw the spirit, the spirit out and, and bring them home. There was a band playing in the cemetery that day. Um, and I drifted over toward the band and um, listened to them play. And in the book, I write uh, this, I have a few more minutes, so this is another of my favorite parts of the book, so I'm just going to read this to you. Um, like all Mesoamerican people, the Zapotecs of Teotihuacan continue to live with an understanding of time that is completely different than ours. It's not simply that they continue to live largely without clocks or watches, regulating their day's activity by the position of the sun. There's a way of life that can be summed up as Indian time. And even today, the Zapotec people live with that understanding of time. We're all vividly conscious of time in the sense of having just so much of it before our next appointment, before our final appointment with death. But what do we really understand about time? The central clock ticks with the pulse in the veins of men. Moths and birds carry a similar timepiece and smaller timepiece, and so we pity them. The redwoods of California with their mighty lifespan are envied as possessing something closer to godlike mortality. To us, Anglo-Saxon time is horizontal and in movement. It's a stream going out of the past, through the present, into the future. The human game for us is to rush along with time as far as possible into the future. Time is a one-way current that carries us inevitably toward death. But the Indians have, enough, have lived for thousands of years by another conception of time, and by that conception, at the core of Mesoamerican religion, the Indians believe that time is vertical. Time does not go anywhere. 
Time moves only like the oceans move in waves, in tides, and in currents, staying within this given space. Time cannot move because time is space. Despite the Christian idea that it mixed with the Indian belief, the modern Zapotec has held on to this general attitude of time, which was at the heart of their belief. After the cemetery, um, we went back home, where Felix poured a glass of mezcal for himself. <laughs> it's about 2.50, and in Teotihuacan, the spirits arrived at 3 o'clock on the 1st of November, 3 o'clock sharp. Look at my watch now, it was 2.56. Petra materialized in front of me with her own bottle of mezcal. She poured herself a shot, drank it, and disappeared. I thought of my parents, my deceased parents, my mother, my father, and I wondered where they were. I understood that they were still there in my past, in that part of my life I had already lived. But where were they now, at this moment? Felix lived work about and placed it on the floor in front of the altar. He took a bottle of mezcal, poured a tiny glass full, and dashed it on the floor in the shape of a cross. Petra reappeared, gliding through the room, waving a chalice, filling the room with the heavenly fragrance of Kripal. I expected the church bells to ring at any second now. Rockets would be launched skyward, announcing the arrival of the spirits. I wondered if the spirits of my parents could find me here, so far from home. Petra appeared in the doorway, the light pouring in was intensely bright, nearly blinding. Petra was still waving the chalice, still smoking the room with Kabbalah. I heard the church bells begin to ring, strong and clear, announcing the arrival of the spirits. Rockets were ripping into the sky. Flares, I thought. Flares launched toward the balcony of the gods. We must be awakened now to release the spirits to come back home to earth. Memory shifted to awareness. My father and my mother were with me. I could feel their presence and I knew their love for me. Daddy had things he needed to tell me. Mother wanted to be there close to me. It was time to talk and to be together with him. Now Felix was in the doorway. The church bells were ringing faster now. Rockets were screeching into the heavens. Felix poured another shot in the scalp. Felix was dancing in the doorway. His stomach key, he exclaimed, they are here. They have arrived. The spirits have arrived. Felix Gonzalez died in 2009 at the age of 77. I had not been back to Teotihuacan since I spent the days of the dead with Petra and Felix in 2005. The last time I spoke with Petra or Papa, Felix's son, was in the June of 2014. I was hoping to travel to Teotihuacan again with a group of friends to spend the day of the dead with them. And I called to be sure if it was okay. Paco answered the phone. We spoke for a few minutes and made plans for my group to join them on the little one. Then Paco told me that his mother, Petra, now 92 years old, was there and she wanted to speak with me. I waited, holding the phone to my ear. There was a few seconds before she spoke and then I could hear her breathe. I was hearing her breathe from 2,000 miles away. Petra, yes. Two. Is that you? Petra's voice, raspy and weak with age, came back. See more chicharron? See more chicharron? See more chicharron? After a pause, I heard her gentle, sweet voice again. Es una maravilla. Es una maravilla. Sí, Petra. En verdad, es una maravilla. Life itself is a miracle. So now I ask myself, what have I learned since the first time I saw this photograph? What have I learned since um, Manuel Alvarez Bravo showed me this picture in 1971? What does this picture mean to me now? A young woman in the sunlight holding the candy skull with a single word, amor. Reminds me of a question that I once heard an English professor, George Reeves, pose to a class of students. If you had to sum up all the poetry ever written in one short sentence, he asked the class, what would you say? The class was silent, mute in the face of such a daunting question. The professor had his answer ready. 
love the world with which he died. For me, now, Alvarez Bravo's photograph carries that simple yet eternal message. The professor's brash summation of all the poetry I've written, love the world before you die, is what I see in that photograph. In the days of the dead, as I have come to understand them, are celebrated as a reminder that life is precious, that life is once forever. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.